Good morning, St. James. It's good to be with you. I hope you've had a good week. I want to start with a big thank you to Jim and Sally for opening up Chapultepec to us. Uh, it really was wonderful to have our first outdoor worship last week. With all of the restrictions on it, I wasn't sure what to expect, uh, but it was remarkably, in fact, I was bowled over with how meaningful it was. Um, it really, uh, the spirit was was incredibly present there for us to be able to gather for the first time. And, um, I encourage you to sign up for the next uh, time. Uh, we are capping it at 75 uh, so that we don't have to worry about uh, the distancing. Uh, we do ask that if you uh, come that you want RSVP uh, for, for your, your whole household, uh, that you bring a chair uh, or a chair for everyone, uh, and that you come masked um, for worship. You can see all of uh, the information and uh, how to get to the Christian's house. And I thank you to the Christians for opening up their, their property to us uh, uh, in the weekly news. And if you need any more information, you can reach out to Nancy uh, for that. So, uh, so thank you to uh, uh, Jim and uh, Sally, and thank you Christians for hosting the next one, which will be on the 26th. Um, with that, uh, all of the other announcements are in the weekly email. I encourage you to look at that. Um, I continue to reach out in, in prayer and support to, to, to one another uh, and, and keep us abreast of anything going on in the community that we should be aware of. And with that, let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Love you, St. James. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not. And for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This is the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask for prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities that they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Keith, Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Omni, Kristen, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Anne, Marilee, Marie, 
and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services and those facing economic insecurity as a result of this COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal School, Church, and our Stephen ministers and their care and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the de for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat among with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the great gifts that I find in Scripture, one of the incredible wisdoms bestowed upon those early storytellers and compilers of Scripture, was what was left in the story. What wasn't buffed or shined out, 
what wasn't cut or edited. We have a tendency to make our heroes larger than life to put them up on a pedestal, to make them superhuman until we realize that's just not true. The heroes of Scripture, in the few details that we have about any of these stories, were remarkably human, incredibly flawed, unlikely, but those details were left in. And I think that's part of the resonance that we have thousands of years later with these people uh, is that we can see more of ourselves because let's be honest, we know our own brokenness, our own sins, uh, our own shortcomings better than anyone. But it allows us to enter more fully into the story, but it also allows us to believe and to trust that we can be instruments in our age of God's healing, of God's redemption, of God's love and grace spilled out into the world. But let's look at it. Adam and Eve, their disobedience. Noah had a drinking problem. Abraham, we already spilled enough uh, ink on Abraham and uh, just a few weeks ago and, and how he conveniently uh, uh, pushed Sarah aside as his sibling uh, when he needed to uh, protect his own, own hide. Uh, and then some other morally ambiguous decisions he made after that. Moses was on the lam. He was a murderer. He killed a guard for, uh, in an act of rage for abusing a slave. And when he was called to be God's voice in the world, he pointed out that he had a speech impediment that made that impossible. God didn't give up on him. David wasn't even lined up amongst the brothers to be a possible heir apparent. They said, you got to have more siblings than this. Is there another child? Is there another son? Uh, well, there's David, but you don't mean him. He's a ruddy boy. He's taking care of the sheep. And even after he proves himself and becomes a mighty king, that power, it becomes something that corrupts. He's so used to getting what he wants that when he sees this beautiful woman uh, bathing, he's going to have her, even if it means sending her husband to the front lines and making sure that he doesn't return from war and taking her as his own. But even then, even with that heinous act, he's not dismissed. He has to atone for that. But he's not dismissed. And his progeny, Solomon, has incredible wisdom. He built the temple to God. But he's seduced by worldly goods. He's seduced by the women, uh, the international women in his life. And then we get to the New Testament, and it's just more of the same. Uh, Peter, he tries as he might, but he just always seems to be a day late and a dollar short, just doesn't quite get it. And his insecurity and his fear get the best of him. And even after he's told that he will deny Jesus three times, he still does in his hour of need. Even after he's emboldened by the Holy Spirit, he still has tunnel vision and refuses to see this gift this gift of knowing God intimately as something to be shared with all people. And so he kind of draws a line in the sand and says the Gentiles are not to be included amongst the faithful. He wrestles with Paul about this. Speaking of Paul, God didn't discover his brokenness. His, his brokenness didn't happen after uh, he started uh, uh, doing the work. Uh, it was on full display when God called him. He was killing followers of Jesus. He took it as a full-time job, and he was good at it. Luckily, he got a name change, so all the, uh, the pre-Paul stuff that he did as Saul uh, seems to get exonerated, but God knew the fullness of who he was and what he had done and still used him to build the church. D. 
These are our heroes, and they're not that different than us. And now here we are called to be church in our time. And it hasn't been an easy time to be church. But as I think about the parable that Jesus tells, that parable of the chaff, chaff and the wheat, of the darnel or the, um, uh, uh, the weeds and the wheat, and seeing that they grew up together, and everyone wanting to quickly pluck the weed o- away from the wheat, Jesus says, that's not your job. That's not your job. Your job is not to say, that person is weed. That person is irredeemable. That person is good. Your job is to be faithful, is to be a community that continues to lift each other up, to help each other grow into the fullness of what you were made to be to wrestle with these difficult issues, to seek justice, not to let the issues fall by the wayside for the sake of not ruffling any feathers, but not casting that judgment, leaving that for God. Any one of these characters that we've just talked about at some point in their life could have been cut down easily, understood to be a weed. Yet in the wholeness of of God's faithfulness and their faithfulness to God, incredible things took root, even from what looked like a weed early on. I don't think this is a message about judgment. I think it's a message about us withholding judgment and working on building up God's vision of seeking the goodness, the part that can nourish in each of us go back to those heroes of the faith. I said I would get back to the story of Jacob. It's a story we didn't read today, but it is uh, for today's reading, Uh, and it it comes on the heels of the stories uh, that have been told the last couple of weeks. Jacob was the younger brother, not the one set to inherit anything. He wasn't the virile, uh, likely antecedent of Abraham. He was his mom's favorite, but he certainly wasn't his dad's. Isaac had planned to make Esau the chosen one. He was born into it. He had more natural affinity with Esau. But mom worked at every angle to try to help Jacob get one up. One day, Esau comes home absolutely famished from a day of hunting and gathering um, and gathering meat for uh, for the family, and he is starving. Jacob has been cooking with his mom and has this red stew ready to go, this uh, delicious stew that the smell filled the room, and he goes in. He says, "I will give anything for that food." I can't tell you how hungry I am. And he says, give me your birthright. You think no amount of food uh, would be worth that, but in the moment, he is so overcome uh, by the visceral hunger that he, that he acquiesces, and he gives Jacob his birthright. But that wasn't enough. As the dad, Isaac, was getting older, he could no longer see And it was clear his days were coming to an end. His mom wanted him to have a blessing, Jacob to have a blessing, a blessing that was really meant for Esau. And so one day while Esau was out uh, hunting and, uh, and doing what was his responsibility in the family to do, they devised a plan. And mom told Jacob to, uh, cover himself with with animal hair because uh, Esau was much hairier uh, and went to uh, elaborate lengths to deceive uh, Isaac in his dying days uh, to to take all of the physical attributes of Esau uh, and try to to mask it uh, on Jacob uh, so that when he went and asked for a blessing, Isaac would think he was blessing Esau. 
and he did. He gave his son Jacob the blessing that was meant for Esau. And so when Esau came back, he was distraught. He asked for the blessing, and his dad says, I can't give you what I've already given away. I am sorry, son. And at that point, the relationship was severed. There was nothing that Jacob could do to make it right with Esau. He had taken everything from him. And so for fear of his own life, he leaves. Rebecca sends him away and says, uh, you need to go and you need to go get a, a, a wife from, uh, from my land uh, and you just need to flee because your, your brother is making plans to kill you. And so while he's on the road, I can only imagine what's going through his mind. I imagine part of it is the realization that he's like the tares, much more so than like the wheat, that he's sold a good bit of his soul, that he's taken everything from Esau, that he took a little bit of dignity from his dad. I imagine he felt very much like he should be cut down, like this was probably the end of his story. From that proud lineage of Abraham, there he was in the middle of the wilderness. Only place to lay his head was on a rock that he found. And there in this place, he had to be contemplating where he fit into that divine story. How flawed he was. How much he felt like something that could be easily thrown into the fire. And as he goes to sleep, he has this dream, this vision, where in this place in the middle of nowhere, uh, which is more than just in the middle of nowhere, in his life he's in the middle of nowhere. He can't go back to where he came from. He doesn't know what's ahead. The future doesn't look particularly bright. I don't know what he thought about himself, but it can't have been particularly good. And in that moment, God comes to him. And there's this image of a ladder descending between heaven and earth. As if God was in that moment and in that place, that this place was a place pregnant with God uh, and the angels ascending and descending up and down the ladder. And people have, uh, have wrestled over the years of what this means, uh, that that we have seasons in our life where we're moving more towards God, where we're ascending the ladder, and that we have seasons, seasons of being like the tares, where we, we're distant, we're broken. We're not the people God made us to be. That all of that is part of this journey. There's also the aspect of that ladder where there's the assumption that maybe our actions here have consequences beyond this place. That as the angels ascend and descend the ladder, it reminds us that there are reverberations in how we choose to live this life and in this moment. The things we, we, we condemn, the things we uh, don't forgive, the actions we make, the places we fall short. But as I wrap my mind around all of this, I think Jacob needed not necessarily to look out and not cast judgment on any of the other characters in his life, but in his own heart, to realize that he was a beloved child of God. And that there are days where he felt very much like the wheat, the darnel. And there are days where he felt very much like the wheat. But there was a never a day where God was not in the midst of it. Never a day where God wasn't working out God's purposes in and through his life. And maybe that's one of the more important messages that we take from these two stories. Not to cast judgment on others, but also not to cast judgment on ourselves. 
to realize that our actions have consequences, maybe even beyond what we can see uh, and feel in this world. But whether we're journeying towards God or whether we are in those seasons of our lives where we feel separated from God, that God is present in the moment, that that place between heaven and earth, between our lives and the divine, are never really all that far apart. And that God is taking those broken places and God is using them. Like God has always used the full humanity of each and every one of us to work out God's purposes. That in those fragile places, those places that are opened up, that we might realize that it's not despite those places, it is through those places that we can be fully God's instruments of healing, grace, and love in the world. Amen. Hello. I'm going to sing hymn 599, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Remember that life is short. We have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and may the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, Alleluia.
Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.